We're going. All right. Welcome back, folks. Another edition Welcome of back. whatever the heck we're calling this thing at this point. So, <laughs> wife, what's new? Gosh, we uh, went up and visited John and Kate Wellborn up in Austin mm-hmm. a couple days ago for their power athlete some, block, uh, one. block one yep. methodology course. Um, that was super fun. fun. Awesome yeah. folks. Mm-hmm. Uh, I gave a little spiel, a little bit around Sacred Cow, the project that Diana Rogers and I are working on, both book and film. Although I have virtually nothing to do with the film, I will appear in it, but mm-hmm. we'll take no credit for much of anything else beyond that. Um, we did a little bit of stuff for Wade's Army. Uh, yep. The Wellborns are in the middle of their annual fundraising drive for Wade's Army, which is um, a uh, fight against childhood cancer, specifically neuroblastoma, which is very dear to them. Uh, one of Kate's uh, college friends actually had twins, one of whom ended up... Uh, and the Wellborns have twins. And the Wellborns virtually have twins the same as age, well. Yeah. Yep. So uh, Wade, one of the twins, ended up getting neuroblastoma and passed away. So this is a big uh, fundraiser for them. And so anyway, wadesarmy.org is where you can learn more about that. It's something we'll be talking about a lot here in the next couple months. And we're probably going to do some collaborative fundraising stuff with Element and some other things. So Mm -hmm. big deal, real real near and dear to everybody's hearts around the power athlete community Mm -hmm. as well as what we do. So yeah, you'll hear more about Wade's Army in the future. Yep. Uh, what else? What else? Lots of deer here in our neighborhood. Yes. <laughs> no shortage no deer of ticks deer. Yet. Hopefully knock not. Wood. Knock on wood. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. We could just jump in. We could. You ready? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's see here. Our first question this week is from Leanne. Are low calories okay when in ketosis? Hi, Rob. We have all heard the stories of people eating very low fat and low calorie diets to lose weight, like in The Biggest Loser, and they later gain the weight back and can no longer eat as much as they used to and maintain as their metabolism is messed up. I'm wondering if there's any science behind a low calorie, like 800 to 1000 per day, hurting your metabolism. My thinking is if you're getting enough nutrients between food and supplements within the 800 calories, plus your body is eating your fat stores, would there not be any negative effects? I'd love to hear your thoughts. I was not able to find anything relating to this on the web. I've always tried to stick to a small calorie deficit, eating around 1600 to 1800 per day. And while successful, lower calories would probably speed up my weight loss. I've lost about 60 pounds following your plan. Still have another hundred to go. Thanks and love everything you do. Thanks for changing my life. Leanne. And she says she's a keto masterclass student. Awesome. Cool. It's almost like that stuff works. Mm -hmm. So, uh, man, there's a lot to unpack in this. So it's interesting. I'll use Luis Villasenor as an example and really just all of the keto gains community, which we've learned so much kind of observing those guys and hanging out with those folks. So Luis is very muscular. Uh, he's several inches shorter than I am, but he's probably like five to 10 pounds heavier than I am. Super muscular, very active now involved with Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, like five days a week, in addition to his strength training and really motoring along with both of those. And so he probably weighs about 170, maybe 175 pounds, somewhere in that range and is quite active, has eaten a ketogenic diet for 20 plus years. And he only eats about 1200 to 1600 calories a day, which most people would freak out and they're like, oh my God, that's too little. And uh, the the thing about it that I think is interesting and, and Leanne brings up something that is really important. The rebound dieting is very injurious to the metabolism. So some people in kind of the evidence-based uh, nutrition space, they point this out rightly, but they, they, they make a solid case. A couple of these folks have made the solid case that if you do something, find something that you're going to do permanently, mm-hmm. which is great advice, but it's clearly very difficult to do. The tendency is that once somebody has um, really severely dieted down, although I will lean on the, the fact that most of the studies being cited here are kind of the standard high carb, low fat. And, and even though that can work, I just wonder if there's, you know, kind of a different metabolic endpoint in that, that whole story with regards to stress and all that type of stuff. But it's, uh, God, I'm thinking like 50 different things. I'm trying to, to pin down the, the course here. What's interesting to me is when people follow a nutrient dense kind of keto paleo type diet, 
they don't seem to need as many calories. Like the, the usual caloric re recommendations are not really there. I think I've uh, mentioned in the past that ages ago, talking with Greg Glassman, the founder of CrossFit, he recommended a modification of the zone diet that ended up being a very high fat zone diet and it, a type of approach. It was about 65 to 70% fat. It's a little higher in carbohydrate than what you would see in a standard keto recommendation, but also he was doing this within people that were doing CrossFit. So it's mm -hmm. kind of, you know, probably not that big of a deal to be, uh, you know, for like someone my size, I would have been uh, 140, 150 grams of protein, similar amount of carbs, and then whatever fat filled out the, the rest of that to, to make 70% of calories. But what he noticed is that people were pretty consistently about 25 to 30% lower in caloric need than what they were when they were eating a, a standard kind of westernized diet. So it, it, it's hard to tell on this stuff, you know, what is going to injure someone versus not injure someone. A uh, shameless plug for Element, I think that being on point with electrolytes, in particular sodium, is kind of a make or break story, uh, uh, you know, or, or facet of this story. If people are both low calorie, low carb, and deficient in sodium, then that is exacerbating the stress response in the body. So, could definitely make a case that you need to be on point with the, the sodium requirements, but it it's interesting and I still, I, I've got to say that like when I first arrived at the keto gain scene and saw what Tyler and Luis were doing and what folks were achieving in that community, when I looked at the calorie intake levels, I was kind of like, holy smokes, man. Like it, it was a little intimidating, but, and again, it's anecdote and we're going to be doing some pieces talking about anecdote and what we can and can't learn from that. And maybe, you know, how to couch that in a more productive uh, fashion, but when you see thousands and thousands of people succeeding and not being broken, not having their, their cycles destroyed and stuff like that, then you, you start seeing some trends. And granted, it's not a randomized controlled trial and all that stuff. There could be some selection bias going on there, but it, I, I'm not nearly as concerned about these lower calorie intakes as a lot of other folks are. And it seems like if, uh, if keto works for you, both from a metabolic level and a performance level, it seems like a good option to, to um, kind of mitigate those blood sugar highs and lows, which I think makes eating a lower calorie intake easier. There is kind of a reality that if you are consistently fueled off of carbohydrate, your body is going to naturally be hungrier more often as we deplete the carbohydrate stores in our body. If you are more consistently fat fueled, even though you will get hungry, it's a different type of hunger and it's a different type of frequency with regards to the way that hunger occurs. So you could make a case that the lower carb approach to a low calorie diet might buy one some, some headroom or some buffer with regards to hunger, which is really going to be key for making this stuff work long term. So okay. any, uh, any thoughts you have on that or? Um, I don't think so. I mean, you make the point that, uh, Luis is eating 1200 to 1600 calories. Um, what do you think about Leanne's caloric intake? It, 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 it's hard to know. I don't know if she's five foot two. I don't know right. if it, it, you know, what her lean body mass is and whatnot, right. but the, the chances are she's probably in an ideal body state, probably smaller and less muscular than Luis. Probably, because um, even though Luis isn't super tall, he's very <laughs> big, <laughs> yeah. you know. So, uh, you know, the numbers that she's citing there, they might get adjusted up a little bit once she hits maintenance. Mm -hmm. But it, it's surprising how uh, uh, it, people, even at pretty remarkably high work output in that community, are not eating massive amounts mm -hmm. of calories. And again, there's there's a uh, I think a certain thermodynamic efficiency, and this is kind of an interesting thing. I'm glad you mentioned that so I can spin this thing out and make it even longer. There, it, it, we've talked about this in the past earlier when we launched the, the Keto Masterclass, because historically there's been this kind of meme within keto low carb land specifically that you can kind of eat all the fat and it doesn't matter so long as you keep insulin levels low. In fact, I could make the case that you need fewer 
calories on keto. And we've kind of gone through and made that case elsewhere. But again, there's a certain thermodynamic efficiency. There's a certain satiety element to this whole story. So I could actually make the case that you probably require fewer calories mm -hmm. on keto than you do on a more mixed diet. So that is definitely something to keep in mind, which could tweak this stuff. And even though I'm not as um, starry eyed about caloric restriction and fasting from a, a longevity perspective as many people are, like I don't think it's gonna double human average lifespan and stuff like that, there are clearly some benefits to simply not overeating, which saying simply not overeating is an incredibly not simple thing to do in the modern world. So yeah. Okay. All righty. Let's see. Our next question is from Steven on weighted blankets. Rob, I've been hearing a lot about a lot about weighted blankets lately in relation to calming anxiety and improving quality of sleep. Do you have any experience with these and any idea if they would be a good sleep hygiene hack oh, for someone who just wants to optimize sleep? Love the podcast. I know you love all things hack. All things hack. Yes. Um, <laughs> I have zero experience with the weighted blanket. It, it makes sense. I've heard people mention that they definitely benefit from that. Like uh, uh, talking to a really uh, interesting guy, Julian, who is a, a brilliant strength and conditioning coach. And he's talking, helping to educate me a lot about the different ways that the sympathetic versus parasympathetic nervous system gets stimulated. And there are situations where compression on our skin can stimulate a sympathetic response, which would kind of, you know, jazz us up. And then there's other situations where it would kind of calm us down. So this would be something where oh, hopefully they have like a money back guarantee and you can try it for the 30 days and try it. I, I will do a shameless plug for the chili pad or it's going by the Uller O O L E R, or you can look at uh, chili pad, I think.com. Mm -hmm. the, these are just game changers for, it's more sleep. of a hot cold. It, it's a hot cold aspect, modulator, yeah. but yeah, but getting the right temperature for when you want to go to bed, ideally your body temperature drops, but like between you and I, um, there's maybe a 10 degree temperature difference between what we would like the room to be. So yeah, yeah. I highly recommend the chili pad and I mean, a weighted blanket seems cool. And, uh, you know, who knows, maybe it'll even put it you on your Christmas rays. list, put it on your Christmas list and then try it out and then let us know. Yeah, or you could re-gift it if you're really good at, <laughs> at packaging it back up. Yeah. Okay. Our next question is on keto and bowel movements from Amanda. She says, hi, my question today is on keto and bowel movements. I've been keto for over five months, thanks to the Keto Masterclass and Paleo for almost seven years. I love the philosophy of how you do... How do you look, feel, and perform? And I've seen improvements in all of those categories since first becoming Paleo and then Keto. My question is on bowel movements while on keto. What is normal and what is a red flag? As you have stressed, supplementation with electrolytes is key, and I was taking magnesium a little too much. One element during the day and natural calm before bed. Bowel movements were overly loose, and that's never fun. I've been taking natural calm for years, and it was part of my nighttime routine before starting keto. The oversupplementation of magnesium was an unintended consequence. After watching the magnesium, I've become more solid, but feel bowel, bowel movements are less frequent overall. Digestion is slow moving and I feel pressure in my lower abdomen, not pain, not bloating or anything like that. Just some pressure. The pressure will be there till I eat and things are pushed through. Is this normal? Am I eating too large of meals? Are there electrolytes I could be missing? I typically have a large breakfast, a medium lunch and a small dinner. I sometimes fast dinner. It just depends on my schedule between the satiating nature of keto and the breakfast lunch. I rarely feel I need anything in the evenings. Thanks for all you do. I hope you'll, you are settling into your new home and look forward to future podcasts. Man, they, it, you know, I noodled on this one a lot because clearly if you have some sort of belly discomfort, like that, that's not a, a good thing. This is one of the problems that I had with veganism ages ago. And then even more recently, since I caught this gut bug, like it, 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 virtually any plant material. I've been able to add a little bit back, a tiny bit of berries. I had a pickle the other day, like a fermented pickle, and it was amazing. And it didn't run, send me running to the to the can. But uh, you know, your poo consistency is is um, uh, really important. There's like the Bristol stool chart that shows like 
overly formed and improperly formed and then too loose and all that stuff. So I guess I would bounce between checking out the Bristol stool chart and seeing where things look on that spectrum. And then also, uh, I, I don't, keto for some people can slow things down, for some people can speed it up. Like some of the, the testing that I did, trying, it was a GI map, um, and I'll, I'll do a piece on that on this whole thing in the future, an ongoing investigation and trying to figure out what's trying to kill me here. But what's interesting is I had a super high methanogen population, which methanogens typically slow gastric motility. So you would think that I would be kind of constipated and I am exactly the opposite. And so this is where this stuff is really freaking hard to unpack sometimes. So um, certainly, so like if the natural calm is too loosening, you could certainly shift to something like a... Uh, Magnesium malate, which is what we use in Element because it's more absorbable, but it will have like a very, very mild laxative effect. Uh, I don't know if the meals are too large. Like the, those are certainly things to, to, play, to with. play with. But, you know, we do notice that if, if people are under hydrated, under electrolyted, then that can certainly affect gastric emptying and, and motility and whatnot. So those are the... The places to play but I, I guess if we were to put some actionable steps on here I would recommend checking out the source naturals magnesium malate three capsules are like 600 milligrams of magnesium maybe try doing a breakfast lunch dinner with that and see how you do ideally we're able to address this stuff without specific supplementation but you know that that seems like a, a pretty safe place mm -hmm. to start um didn't really mention what the composition of the diet is. So if uh, maybe Just adding keto. more keto, but, but keto yeah. could be virtually carnivore, all carnivore, or it could be like a massive amount of, you know, kale, broccoli, spinach. So right. increasing vegetable intake could certainly be a, a thing. Also increasing raw vegetable intake because it's a little more difficult to digest and it, it's definitely going to tend to move things along. So the actionable steps I would tinker with would be potentially a magnesium supplement and a magnesium malate in addition to what she's doing. Source Naturals is a great company. And then increasing potentially vegetables in general and raw vegetables in particular. And then maybe circle back and let us know how that's going. Okay. All righty. We've got a question from Jason. We have a couple of philosophical questions yes. in this episode. Yeah. Mildly this, philosophical. This one is city versus suburban versus small town versus country life. Hi, Nikki and Rob. Since you're in the middle of moving, I've got a question about where I should live. In my last gig, I needed to live in the city for work, a suburban house, but with good access to transit and easy bike ride to work. I've recently switched to working remotely, so I've got a lot more flexibility and wondering if I might benefit from a different way of life. What are your thoughts on living situations and surrounding built environments and their impacts on health and happiness? For reference, we're a mid-30s married couple with no kids, but trying, and a dog. Mostly homebodies, but we have friends, family, and a great CrossFit box in the city. Lots of options for living in small towns, acreages, hobby farms, near the lake, all within an hour drive of the city. I've been a follower for many years, and your work has helped me in so many ways. So thank you, Jason. Do you want to take a stab at that? Or? Gosh, I feel like where to live is such a personal thing. I mean, I remember when we were in Chico, um, right before we left Chico, I, re I just remember somebody, somebody made the comment like, you know, does your soul sparkle here? And Chico for sure, my soul was not sparkling <laughs> at all. <laughs> you know, so, so I, I, I feel like where you live, like different people gravitate towards mountains, ocean, tree, you know, like the environment I, I think really does impact happiness uh, and overall well being. But I, I think it's a pretty individual. We, we definitely thing. like sunlight a lot. Uh, so we, we're traveling, so I'll get just unpacking this a little bit. Hopefully, it's helpful. If not, you can fast forward through all this stuff, or just turn the damn thing off. So uh, that that's easy enough. But we were in Chico. We had sold the gym. We wanted to get far enough away from the gym that if um, anything went wrong, there was no way possible that we could get drugged back into it. And so we we had traveled a fair amount and uh, really liked the New Mexico Santa Fe area. Mm -hmm. So we moved to the outskirts of Santa Fe. It was really beautiful. It was pretty cool, but we got pregnant right around that time and it was super remote. There mm -hmm. were very few people 
our age having kids and because of the kind of like retiree artsy scene there, it was like Orange County, California was, expensive. It was for like the, you know, to live anywhere near the downtown area. Right. Right. And, and I just don't, I, it, it, New Mexico is beautiful, but, Super but beautiful. it wasn't like, it didn't click for us. Right. And we got pregnant. And so we decided to move to Reno because my dad had moved there recently. My sister was still in Chico. So she was just over the hill. Um, but we went to Reno thinking, uh, it was going to be a two year We're just going to have yeah. the baby here and then figure no out where we're going tax, next. Get our, get our feet under us. You yeah. were a co-founder of a tech company at that point. Mm -hmm. So you were kind of hot and heavy on that. I was on the, the tail end of the, you know, the first cycle of the Palo solution book mm -hmm. doing really well and all the drama that we had with CrossFit and everything else. And so mm -hmm. I shifted a little bit into a Mr. Mom mode to some degree and and uh but but reno surprised us like yeah, we didn't totally. expect to like it the way that we did and um we ended up making some phenomenal friendships and really really liking it and the thing so back to your question about city versus suburban reno was a, you know three hundred thousand people it's a decent sized city but there's topography and mountains and you know you're close enough to get to trees and a lake and you know lake tahoe versus chico being Really, really flat. Quite and, flat, quite hot in the summer. Yeah. Um, so the things that we definitely did like about Reno, it was big enough that it had pretty much everything that you needed, but we were pretty fortunate the, to live somewhere that we had minimal driving. I mean, like super mm -hmm. minimal driving. You in particular really enjoyed the four seasons. Like there's mm -hmm. a legit fall there. The weather changes, mm -hmm. the trees change color. Like it's pretty pretty beautiful it's probably not as spectacular as like places on the the east coast mm -hmm. and whatnot but i mean it was it was pretty cool um and then reno grew a ton mm -hmm. and uh everywhere's growing a ton. Every, everywhere's growing a ton if it's the least bit nice like people are bailing out of the the larger metropolitan areas and stuff like that and i had been kind of intrigued about the texas hill country area for about seven years and we started looking at places like Bernie, well, well, let's not get too far ahead of us because we got a whole question on why we moved to Texas. We, we do, yeah, yeah. So let's 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 so, talk about what Jason's Jason's question like. So he has a lot of options for where he can live, and and I guess it really just depends on what you enjoy doing. Where can you kind of scratch all of the itches of like whatever you like to do for fitness and outdoor stuff, and how tolerant you are to the transit options that you have. Um, the two things that have kind of appealed to me are kind of either being a, a good bit out off the deep beaten path, but with some community around, like some people that the kids can play with and stuff like that. Or like we, when we would do, uh, seminars, we really liked like the park slope area of Brooklyn, like mm -hmm. that, like urban environment that you don't really need a car and you can roll downstairs and there are, uh, shops and restaurants and all that type of stuff like i i, I or, or something like a new urban environment mm -hmm. where there's like stores and and things that you could walk to i could be super drawn to that we now have a horse-sized dog which is going to limit our our opportunities for doing something like that but um i personally could find that pretty appealing because of the simplicity and i'm a little bit more of a people person mm -hmm. like i get a little bit squirrely being alone and mm -hmm. in the same four being walls too, and not too seeing remote. people too, too remote. So, and I will say, cause if you met Jason mentions, he's trying to have kids, like having kids in the middle of nowhere, or I mean, not that you're going to be in the middle of nowhere, but like, that's one thing that we didn't have in Reno when we first had Zoe was like a tight network of friends yet. Cause we had just moved there. And when you're uh, a new mom and you don't have any female mothers around you to help. Like it's, it's, it's no, no joke. joke. So, yeah. um, I, so I would keep that in mind because if you do get pregnant and, uh, you know, and you decide to move kind of far away from your, your social network, that, that could be trying. Yeah. It can it be really be, hard. It could be trying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then also just for, you know, once, once your kids are older, like you, there's, activities that they're going to want to do or you're going to, you know, and so you don't want to be too far away from the ability to do things like gymnastics or swimming, swimming or, whatever, or yeah. you know, any kind of activities that, that you might want to do with them or that they might want to, they might want to, uh, tackle. Yeah. So I don't know, Jason, I think, I think it's some soul searching time, but, uh, 
but it's exciting because you have, you have, I mean, it's an envious, enviable position to be in where you can, you can go wherever you want to go. It, it, just really quickly though, I could make the case that kind of like the suburban environment in which you don't know any of your neighbors, but yet they're kind of all up in your junk is kind of the worst <laughs> of everything because you're both isolated, but mm -hmm. not really any space like that. That's right. my personal kind of kind of feel right. with that versus like in a city, you kind of have the expectation that you're stacked on top of each other, but you have some perks, like maybe you don't need a car and maybe there's all mm -hmm. kinds of super cool stuff mm -hmm. within walking distance. So I, I, yeah. I could, I, I, what would be cool is having a spot in both places or like Airbnb being mm -hmm. part of the year or something like that so that you can scratch those itches too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Our final question this week is from Kirk on why we moved Texas. I wonder if it's Kirk Parsley. I don't think so. No. 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 35 years ago, Kirk hasn't been here that long. Uh, okay. Kirk says, welcome to Texas. I moved here 35 years ago and haven't regretted it. The New Braunfels area is fantastic being in between Austin and San Antonio. So many great attractions, whether it's outdoor recreation, live music, or educational opportunities for your children. No income tax is great as well. However, property taxes might be higher than what you are accustomed to. I know it isn't a health or nutrition question, but could you talk about your decision to move to Texas and what you hope to accomplish here? Mm. Do you want to jump into that? Rob has been working me on a Texas move for seven years <laughs> and I finally the caved the end. No. <laughs> um, well, that is how it all started. You mm -hmm. came out here for a hunting trip about seven or eight years yeah. ago. Uh, no, Zoe was already born, I think. About so, seven. Seven years yeah. ago. And loved it. So it's kind of been in the back of our heads as as uh, a maybe one day we might do that kind of thing. And I guess really the main drivers for this move were is the kids. Like we came out here to visit. I have a cousin that moved here to New Braunfels about seven years yeah. ago. She's got four kids that are same age, similar ages as our girls. And, um, we came to visit and, you know, walking around, there's rivers and parks and live music as, as Kirk mentions. And Reno is great. And we're, we're right now we're in the spot where we're like dearly missing a lot of our Reno, Reno people and how, you know, just our infrastructure in Reno. Um, cause obviously moving, it's hard, especially in Wired like, to Eat. I make that point about sleep, food, and movement, community. and community. Yeah. And like right now, we're meeting people slowly, but we had some amazing community yeah. in Reno. Like our jujitsu school was amazing. Momentum Martial Arts, Ray, Darian, uh, mm -hmm. our great friends Jason and Rochelle. Like mm -hmm. just laundry list of people. Your dad lives mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. uh, we had basically a an adoptive grandmother, uh, Arlie, for mm -hmm. the girls. Mm -hmm. So. I mean, we had some really deep ties there and it's, we were talking about this the other day. I've moved a lot in my life. We've moved a fair amount together. I've never moved and missed anyone. Mm -hmm. And I miss people a lot on this mm -hmm. move for sure. Yeah. yeah. But thinking, but I guess it was one of our early trips here and we just saw young people out and about and holding hands and getting ice cream and just thinking about our kids growing up like this really feels like a better place for, 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 you know, just like wholesome, clean, fun. Like Reno, Reno is great and there's a lot of great things to do and plenty of teenagers navigate it, but it's also, it was just very different. It, like it's, this, it's different. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The first time that we went downtown in New Brunfels, like, like Nikki said, I just noticed there were a bunch of teenagers out clearly on dates and there were probably 12 or 15 live music venues in the walkable downtown area on like a Tuesday night. So these kids would cruise around and go get some ice cream and watch a band and then go somewhere else and watch another band. And I was kind of like, oh, okay, I get that. And then uh, uh, there was like Landa Park, which is this spring fed swimming area in the mm -hmm. middle of town. Schlitterbahn, mm -hmm. which is the world's best water park. We went there apparently. yesterday, actually. Yeah, <laughs> Took we spent the girls like six, there yesterday. six hours. We stayed there so long that when the girls finally got in the car, they had so much fun that they were so fucking smoked that they would just like cry the rest of the day. They were, they were so we wore, we smoked. We wore them out, yep. But it was awesome. It was fun. It was we awesome. with their cousins and yeah, yeah that was Yeah, they hung out with time. their cousins. So 
Uh, I guess some of the other reasons, financial, um, Reno grew enormously and it was getting more and more expensive to live there. And although apparently this area has grown a lot and appears to continue to be growing, we kind of went from one, uh, you know, kind of J curve growth thing to the earlier phase of probably what is another mm -hmm. J curve growth. So like financially it made a lot of sense, uh, with regards to housing and just kind of quality of life. And mm -hmm. also the income for, tax thing wasn't really, and we had no income tax in Nevada. So that, so that was a wash. That was a wash. Yeah. The property taxes are certainly higher here. Um, interest rates are low right now. So that kind of didn't seem it currently seems okay. Right. Like as far right. as, as far as that goes, um, we, better airport, way better. I mean, airport for I, me, yeah. it, it, it's it, kind of a toss up because the Reno airport was like 15 minutes from our house. So well, it was so really could, easy to get it, in if and I, out. Once I got up and I, I sat in my car, it would typically be 15, maybe 20 minutes before I was through security, but you almost inevitably needed to do a multi yeah. flight. It was rare deal. that we had a nonstop. If you weren't yeah. going to Vegas or Salt Lake City or Denver, yeah, you, there know, were that like 12 you had to change flights. planes. Yeah. Whereas we're right in the middle of San Antonio and, and Austin. So you like can look like which airport should I fly flights, out so. of? Which one has the best route? Yeah. Which one, you know, so. But that it was, was an piece. hour and 20 minutes door to through security the to couple Austin. of times to, to Austin from right. our house, which right. isn't horrible. I know lots of, lots of people around the world and around the U S in particular, they're like, dude, I drive an hour to go to the bathroom and that's fine. Mm -hmm. Um, that, we, we were a little bit spoiled in Reno in that where we lived it, again, it was like eight minutes to the airport. Mm -hmm. It was like when the girls were going to Montessori, it was like mm -hmm. seven or eight minutes, 10 minutes to get to there. Whole foods was all of five minutes away. Mm -hmm. Home Depot was six minutes away. Right. So now Home Depot is like 30 minutes 35 away. Minutes yeah. away yeah. Um, and then the school, you mentioned educational opportunities and that's a big one too. Like we had our girls in a Montessori. Um, we, had decided that we weren't going to continue putting him in that particular Montessori and um, the public school we were zoned for in Reno was not great and the that school was actually a fairly big that was that, that yeah. actually kicked yeah. off our whole where yeah. are we going to move mm -hmm. was 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 that because particular we looked thing. and looked and looked and the places that had good schools were super limited and because of the growth around Reno, we were going to kind of sell our house high, but we were just going to be buying high too. So there for something really that would still need like a lot of, a lot of, yeah. yeah, you weren't getting what you really wanted for right. what you were paying for it. Right. So, um, the school thing was a big one and we've actually, so we moved here. We're in a great school district. Um, we're actually homeschooling our children this year. Uh, it's crazy. I know. <laughs> what are we doing? Um, but We've we have had a, a few what the fuck moments <laughs> off of that. But, but we ha but we have a great school if we choose to do that. To do that. Yeah. But it, uh, it's interesting. Um, both girls, kind of unprompted, have just said, "Dada, I really like Texas." Mm -hmm. And I'm like, "Why do you like it?" And it, like all the stuff we're able to do, the fact that they're able to hang out with their cousins. Uh, we live on a cul-de-sac that's, I don't know, like the whole thing is probably like half a mile. If mm -hmm. you went from one, one part of it to the other, maybe a quarter mile to a half mile. They can ride their bikes They get to there. ride their bikes. They look at critters. Like they've caught so many bugs and that's kind of hairball because there's a good number of things that will kill you <laughs> around here. So like in Reno, when Sagan was chasing a frog or a grasshopper, she would just run headlong into a bush and like dive into it. And it really wasn't a big deal there. Here it's like, hey, there are these things called coral snakes and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So we're, you know, that's a mm -hmm. that's a little hairball. But both girls have said that they absolutely love it, and it, it's that's been cool because I know both you and I, between trying to work from home, getting like shit canned by Google and Facebook and like all the other stuff that we've been dealing with, we've had arguably kind of like some of the highest stress that we've had in our whole relationship. And moving across country and then is moving stressful, across country. even I, if you're excited to do it and you, yeah. it's. Fully it was a total gut check, and I don't it's, know if people we mentioned before, but like the movers set our front yeah, yard on fire already, when we, we moved and all that. So yeah. it, it was it was a grind. But despite that, we've tried to keep our shit together as best we can. Um, we've been doing Emily Fletcher's meditation deal, um, mm -hmm. uh, stress less, accomplish more. It's outstanding. Like it, it's mm -hmm. really been a make or break deal. But despite us being pretty stressed out, doing the work we need to do, trying to rejigger all this stuff so that we're not trapped in this kind of uh, Google controlled information monopoly. Um, 
the girls have been really, really happy, mm -hmm. and it, it has definitely seemed like a good move for them. And uh, so long as I can get my digestive health back to what it was when we first well, moved here, I'll right. be really right. jazzed. That, was, that, that was, was a big bonus when we, when you got here the first three weeks and you were so feeling good. so great. It yeah. felt so good. Yeah. So do you want to mention at all what the preliminary findings are of your Oh, I, I could could mention okay. that. So we did uh, some blood testing. I am going to do a really thorough breakdown on this and have the tests themselves, but... Uh, working with Chris Kresser, we're really trying to rule out anything gnarly like cryptosporidium and, uh, uh, you know, Giardia and stuff like that. And what came back was a, a normal range, and I forget what the exponent was on this, but we'll just, we'll just stick with um, uh, the main numbers. A normal range for uh, strep was it, it, at the gut level one. was under one, and mine was like 9.8 like to e to the 23rd, something like that, both, both of them. Um, so it was super high in strep, which Chris is like, hmm, that's a bummer because it, it, it isn't totally conclusive one way or the other what the real issue is. There definitely is literature that suggests that uh, strep overgrowth can... Strep isn't necessarily a pathogenic organism in and of itself, but it can be opportunistic if other things happen and it, it can kind of come in and take over and push some stuff out. Again, I had kind of high methanogen levels, which in theory should make me constipated, but I am absolutely not. And so Chris dug in and uh, apparently if one has had a bout of really terrible food poisoning, which I have had my fair share traveling a lot, and also I think just being a little bit prone to that stuff can set me up for that. But apparently one of the toxins involved in the, the common food poisoning scenarios looks very similar to a protein in the gut. And once you form antibodies against the toxin, then you have effectively set up an autoimmune gut scenario. But it seems to be specific mainly to the small intestine, which what's interesting is you have an inflammatory response in the gut and then this should be like a bonus question. It's like mm -hmm. Rob's poop update, and <laughs> and uh, we'll so separate you separate it out like that. We'll separate it out. Um, uh, you get an inflammatory response in the small intestine, which then pulls a lot of fluid into there, and then that fast tracks everything through the rest of the gut. So that's actually overriding my uh, methanogen production. At least that's part of the thought. The interesting opportunity is there are some antibiotics which only are active in the small intestine and actually have been shown to improve microbial diversity in the uh, colon and large intestine. So there's some hope within mm -hmm. this whole thing, but I'm still mainly kind of... You have to do some more testing. I have to do some more testing. I'm still, I'm better. I also started doing a peptide that Doc Parsley got me on and I'm only coming up on a weekend of that and I feel better, but I don't know if it's just because I've been sick for a month and I'm starting to feel better, but it seems kind of correlative mm -hmm. to me starting this peptide that's supposed to reduce autoimmune gut issues. Mm -hmm. And I will talk more about that in the future also, but, um, I guess dovetailing in the move to Texas, like so far we've really liked it. If all of the people that we love in Reno suddenly moved here, that mm -hmm. would really help. And we are getting to know people in yeah. uh, like, we've gone to, Sport Halla and Gaines Bakery and mm -hmm. met some of the folks there, going to hang out with some of those folks. Mm -hmm. So we're getting to know people. People are very nice, very friendly. Mm -hmm. um, we've enjoyed the, the, the scene at, at large, mm -hmm. uh, but the lack just of... It takes time. Yeah. I mean, we've, we, we've talked about this a lot. It's just, it takes, I mean, even our move to Reno, like it's, it's two to three years before you start getting some start traction getting some on traction. that. I mean, yeah. but you know, we've got kids so we can be more... Back then, we had a newborn, and so I felt like I, I definitely wasn't putting myself out there in it was the early tougher. days of, it was of Reno, yeah. which ties into Jason's question, like, you know, it's a thing to, it's keep, a in thing mind. to keep in mind yeah. with, a new, with a new baby. Yeah. Like even uh, not to beat this thing to death, but maybe kind of dovetailing between both of, of these points, um, we looked at a couple of different developments in New Brunfels, and one of them for me was it had a super low speed limit. It had maybe like 200 houses total. Mm -hmm. 100, it was a, something it's a like small that. development, pretty yeah. small development, but it was mellow. People drove slow. There were mm -hmm. clearly a lot of families there, mm -hmm. but there were, um, the place that we actually ended up going to had a community pool, had some private 
river access to the Guadalupe River, which is awesome. Like it's Guadalupe. super cool. Guadalupe. The Texans say it, Guadalupe. You say it around here. If you want to be on the inn, you say um, Guadalupe. <laughs> well, I've never been on the inn with anything. So, but um, that's interesting because we've had really cool access to swimming and water and stuff like that. But this development is a little less amenable to like the kids can ride around the, mm -hmm. the cul-de-sac, but this other thing, like they literally could have ridden their bikes everywhere right. in that development. And there were lots of kids and you could make the argument that we would have probably gotten to know people faster and all that type mm -hmm. of stuff. So yeah. But we would have, but we would have had much, much fewer died off. with no yeah, swimming yeah, pool access. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. Yeah. I think we've, so yeah, that was addressed. a little bit more of a philosophical, like what's going on in our lives kind of thing. If you guys like that, fire off some more questions. If you guys hate it, I guess don't ask those questions. And again, you can always fast forward through um, any of them. Yeah, any of them. Let's uh, see anything to mention. We are motoring forward on some options around. Like we're gonna we're, have some new we're, stuff we're, rolling out soon. Yeah, yeah. And we'll let yeah. y'all know it about that here in the coming weeks and i will be at the spartan world championship so if folks media are, fest, the, yeah, media fest so i'll be there i am not competing or doing anything they keep trying to sign me up for like the vip thing and i'm like no thanks i <laughs> i did crossfit when crossfit wasn't cool i'm i'm good i'm done <laughs> with that so but uh god bless all of you people who do like going and doing mm -hmm. those things so if you're going to be at the spartan media fest in south lake tahoe i will see you there Anything I, else? Looking I down the road, I will it. be at the Metabolic Health Summit in Long Beach, I think like January. Mm -hmm. And those are kind of the main things on the docket. If you want to follow us, Instagram is kind of the main thing, mm -hmm. at Das Rob Wolf. Submit your questions on the contact page of robwolf.com. And we'll and see you guys we'll see soon. see you next week. Take care. Thanks.